you're just getting into single malt whiskey, I think there's three types of whiskies you should definitely know. The first is the X bourbon cask whiskey. This is an extremely popular style of whiskey within Scotch whiskey. You know, think Glencadam 10, think the Deanston 12. And the second style of whiskey that you should definitely know is the smoky whiskies. You know, think those big peat monsters like Ardberg, Laphroaig, Lagerverlin. You know, it's a really interesting style and I've done a whole video about peated whiskey. But the third style of whiskey that you should definitely know is sherried whiskey. Now, these are whiskies that have been aged in X sherry cask and it's a massive category within scotch. But what even is sherry? And how does it affect the flavor of a whiskey? Well, I'm Phil and I'm gonna fill you in about everything you need to know about sherried whiskey. I would say sherry is the most important fortified wine that whiskey lovers should know about. And that's because when you understand sherry and you understand sherried whiskey, it makes it so much easier when you're going down to the store and you're trying to pick a whiskey because it just completely narrows things down. It gives you one of the major huge categories of scotch. And if you watch to the end of this video, I'm gonna talk about some of the best sherried whiskey you can buy for both the beginner and the experienced whiskey drinker, but also distilleries that are known for making sherried whiskies. But what even is sherried whiskey? Well, sherried whiskey gets its unique flavor from when it's been aged in an ex sherry cask. So a cask that used to have sherry in it and it's been emptied out and now there's whiskey in it. And it's a really good combo because the sherry cask can impart all these really interesting flavors onto the whiskey. And that's because even though the sherry's been tipped out, it can actually soak up about 10 liters of sherry just within the wood. And so over the years, as the weather changes and the temperature changes, the cask breathes and it starts to melt all those really nice flavors in with the whiskey. And as the whiskey sits in these sherry soaked casks, it will start to inherit all these really nice flavors from the sherry cask, like those sweet notes, those nutty notes, the spice notes, and those dried fruit notes. And if you really want to know what kind of flavors whiskey will get from sherry, I definitely recommend going out and buying yourself an actual sherry. This one's an Oloroso, I've actually got two here that are Olorosos, and it'll really fast track your knowledge about what sherry really does to a whiskey. And the other really good thing that sherry does to a cask before whiskey goes in it is that not only can the sherry add all these nice flavors to the wood, but also it takes away a lot of the unwanted harsh flavors from a new oak cask. These are those sort of real sulfury notes, tanniny notes, and those off notes that can really be present with new oak. And this is actually exactly what I'm doing, side note, with my cask project. I've currently Fill this whole barrel up with sherry and so it's taking away those harsh flavors and it's going to be adding those really nice sherry flavors and dried fruit notes to this cask. So I'm going to later empty this out and put whiskey in and hopefully the whiskey will start to inherit all those really nice flavors from that. And if you're interested in that, how to age whiskey in your own cask, uh, make sure you ring the bell because yeah, that video should come out later this year and you don't want to miss it and you don't know when I'm going to upload. You don't know. It's not every day so ring the bell and give the video a like. And the other thing Sherry will do to a whiskey is it will add color. It will often make your whiskey a lot redder in color as opposed to, you know, an ex bourbon cask, which would be a lot sort of lighter and have that kind of more straw color. That's unless there's caramel coloring added, uh, which is a whole other topic and <laughs> I'll get into that in a different video. So we've talked a lot about sherry casks, but what actually is a sherry? Well, sherry is actually a wine, um, but a special type of wine, a little bit like port, it is a fortified wine. And what that means is that it's had a high ABV, neutral grape sort of spirit added to it to bring the ABV up. So often it's gone from 11% alcohol all the way up to 15%. And above. But another part that makes a sherry a sherry is the region it's from. And that's why we need to talk about the sherry triangle. So inside Spain, there's an autonomous community called Andalusia. And in Andalusia, there's a province called Cadiz. And in Cadiz, there's a triangular area between three cities called the Sherry Triangle, which is where sherry must come from. And look, I'm from New Zealand. And my pronunciation is not going to be good. Um, I'm not from, I'm not Spanish or anything. In fact, if you dug a hole right through the center of the earth from where I am now, you'd probably come out about an hour's drive 
from the shared triangle. So literally, you cannot get further away from the shared triangle than I am right now. So yeah, just forgive my pronunciation. So the first town is Jerez de la Fontera, and this is actually the most famous city out of the Sherry Triangle. And that's because it's actually where Sherry gets its name. So basically, the name given to this town by the Moors was Shadish, and over time the English kind of transformed that into the word Sherry. And also, the name for this town given to it by the Persians was Xerdes, I don't really know how to say it, and over time in Spanish that became Hades. And that's actually why on a Sherry bottle you'll see those three names Hades, uh, Xerd, whatever that says, and Sherry. By law, this is now a registered classification. So you cannot call it those names outside of the Sherry Triangle, a bit like Champagne and a bit like Scotch. So Luca de Barameda is the second town. This is actually where a very specific type of Sherry is only made called Manzanilla, but we'll get into that shortly. And the final town of the Sherry Triangle is El Porto de Santa Maria. And within these three cities are the bodegas, and these are the warehouses and companies that make and blend and age and store all the sherry within the triangle. So normally when you're trying to understand a wine, you start with what type of grape was used. But with sherry, it's a little bit different. It's actually better to understand the process of how it's made, a little bit like whiskey. And one of the processes that I really want you to know is whether or not the sherry uses floor yeast. Basically, sherry can divide into two major camps. Uh, one type is the sort of oxidized sherry, where it just has contact with the air and oxygen, and the other is actually a type that has a layer of white kind of floor yeast that protects the sherry from oxidization, which is, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. It's this indigenous type of yeast that's only from the sherry triangle. So whether or not a sherry is oxidized or not really helps us define the different categories of sherry. So on a spectrum, on one side of it, you have the really dry, the really crisp, but the really light types of sherries. And that's the thing, right? Normally, like when I used to think about sherry, I thought of like a real sweet kind of thing that your grandma would kind of drink, and that's actually not true at all. There are some super dry sherries, like the Fino, like the Manzanilla. Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the oxidized sherries. Sherries like the PX are really sweet and heavy sherry, and then you have a bunch of sherries in between. But the first sherry I want to go into detail about is the most common type of sherry you'll see on a sherried whiskey label, and that is the Oloroso. In fact, I'd say it'd be around 90% of all sherry whiskies. In fact, just even what's in front of me, um, we've got the Abelor Abana here. It says right on the front of it, it says matured in Spanish Oloroso sherry butts. Tamdu 12, that's aged in Oloroso sherry butts. The Glendronic 12, matured in the finest PX and Oloroso sherry cast. We'll talk about PX in a second. But you can really see that Oloroso is used a lot within the whiskey industry. So Oloroso is also a oxidized type of sherry. And the reason that it's oxidized is because the floor yeast that protects other types of sherries from being oxidized can only survive between 14.5% ABV and around 16% ABV. So any higher than that and then the yeast starts to die. And Oloroso kind of starts at 17% and goes up, so that's exactly what's happened with this Oloroso sherry. And because of this oxidization, it means that the sherry starts to kind of darken. It goes a more tawny kind of amber color. And that's exactly the color that ends up imparting onto the whiskey, like this Tamdu that goes that kind of amber tawny color. So Oloroso is typically a full bodied kind of heavy sherry. It gives you lots of sort of dried fruit notes like figs and dates and other notes like spice and chocolate and berries and also some nutty flavors like walnuts. So let's jump back to the other side of the spectrum, which are the non-oxidized types of sherries, which have that layer of white kind of floor yeast. And what's really interesting about this yeast is it actually eats away at the sugars in the sherry, which makes the sherry really dry. And when I say dry, it just means non-sweet. So these sherries are generally very pale in color, which, and actually there are two types of non-oxidized types of sherries. And the first one is Fino. So Fino is from the province of Jerez, and it's often known as the inland twin of Manzanilla. It's a really dry sherry. It's often characterized by crisp, fresh citric notes, lots of nutty notes like walnut, almonds, and hazelnuts, but also some ripe fruit notes like peach and apricot and jam. And generally it's a little bit more bready and less salty than the Manzanilla. 
So let's talk about Manzanilla. So even though it's made using the same methods as Fino and it's real similar to Fino, the big difference is its location, which can only be made in one of the points of the Sherry Triangle, Saluka. In Saluka, it basically has a coastal terroir, it's like a real salty microclimate. It's also a lot cooler than the other regions, but has higher humidity. And all this means that the floor yeast survives really well, which means the floor yeast is even thicker, causing the sherry to be even drier, even crisper. And it has a lot more salty notes compared to the Fino. However, in terms of using the Manzanilla or Fino for aging whiskey in it, it's pretty rare. You don't see many of them, and that's because it often can make our whiskey even drier, but also it's just really hard to get hold of and it can be really expensive. Okay, so we've explored the kind of lighter types of sherries like Fino and Manzanilla, and we've also explored the other end, which is the oxidized, heavier types of sherries like the Oloroso. But there's actually a couple of sherry types in the middle, like Amontillado and Palo Cordado. So Amontillado is kind of known as the fusion style of sherry. because basically it starts off its life with kind of a yeast floor, and then what they do is they re-fortify it, bringing the ABV up, which kills off the yeast floor and then starts to oxidize it. It's lighter and fresher than Oloroso, but at the same time, heavier and darker than a Fino or a Manzanilla. So in terms of flavors for the Amontillado, you're gonna get flavors like ripe apple, like dried apricot, then some real yeasty notes, ginger notes, and then some nutty notes like walnut and almond. This one here is the Glenmorangie tame it's finished in Amontillado casks but again this is an exception there's not many whiskies out there that are finished in Amontillado cask because yeah it's a hard cask to get hold of so the next style is the Palo Cordado, and this is the most confusing style out of all the different styles of sherry because basically the whole style is based on flavor and that's kind of up to the interpretation of the different bodegas based on what they sort of think a Palo Cordado is. I think if you want to learn more about the style of sherry and actually just go deeper into sherry in general, go over to Eric Waite Whiskey Studies. We're going to be doing sherry and sherry cast finished whiskies. He's like a wine som who also makes whiskey videos, so the guy ask him those real deep geeky questions about it. In general though, Palo Cordado is going to be dry and crisp like a Fino, but also have the body and weight of an Oloroso. It's only around one to 2% of all sherries, so you're really not gonna see that many whiskies being aged in a Palo Cordado cask. So I don't wanna talk about it too much. So let's jump on to the grapes. So I haven't even talked about grapes yet, and that's because 95% of all sherries all come from the same type of grape, and that is the Palomino grape. So if it's an Oloroso, it's a Palomino grape. It's a Fino, it's a Palomino grape. So it's a pretty neutral style of grape. It's very low in acidity, and that really highlights how sherry's all about the process, and it's not really about the kind of grape itself. However, there are actually other types of sherry styles that are made with different types of grapes, and one of them is the Pedro Jimenez, or known as PX for short. The main difference between this grape and other styles of grape is it goes through a sun drying process which basically concentrates all the sugars and makes it the sweetest of all the sherries. So this sherry is really really dark, almost like food colouring. It contains some really sweet notes like prunes and also some other heavy notes like coffee and licorice and spice. So this type of sherry is so rich and so dark, it's often used as kind of a dessert syrup over ice cream and all sorts of things. So you can kind of imagine the sort of real sweetness and flavors it's gonna to bring to whiskey when it's aged in one of these whiskey casks. So even though this is quite a minor grape overall, I think it's only around 2% of sherry production, it actually is quite a common type of sherry you'll see on whiskey bottles. So this Glendronic actually right here is aged in a combination, and it says on the front, it's matured in Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso sherry casks. So the last grape is Moscatel, also known as Muscat, and this is also very tiny production, and it's made in a very similar way as PX, using the sun drying kind of process. So it's gonna be very sweet, it's gonna have a lot of those sort of raisin notes. 
Cool, so I helped you now knowing all the different types of sherries. I know it took a little while to get through, but now when you look at a whiskey bottle, you might go, oh, Oloroso, it's gonna be pretty nice. PX, oh, it's gonna be a little bit sweet. Fino, oh, it'd be quite dry. Now I need to talk about one of the biggest misconceptions that people have about sherry. So most sherry casks used within the Scotch whiskey industry have a secret, and that is the sherry cask that's got the sherry in it uh, when the sherry is taken out, it's not actually sold as sherry. And to find out why that is, we need to talk about the Solera system. So part of the reason there isn't any really true ex-sherry cask whiskey where the sherry was actually used for drinking sherry is because of the Solera system. And the Solera system is basically the system where they have a whole lot of barrels and when you want to bottle a bottle of sherry, basically you take it from the oldest casks. And when you take it from the oldest casks, they then get refilled by the next oldest casks, and then they get refilled by the next oldest casks and so on. So basically the Solera system is not actually about the wood kind of maturing the sherry, it's actually about the cask actually just being basically a storage container so the sherry can mature on its own. So basically in the Solera system, the casks are pretty tired, they're pretty old, and this is actually how the sherry producers want it. They don't want the cask to impart any sort of wood and tannin notes onto the sherry. And basically the only time you'd ever take a cask out of this whole sherry Solera system is basically if the cask can't physically be used anymore. So even though pretty much all sherry is aged in kind of the Solera system, I can't actually think of a single example where a whiskey was aged in an ex Solera cask. So contrary to the sherry producers who don't really want any woody notes, they don't want any tannins, uh, the whiskey producers often do want some of those woody notes that are imparted onto the whiskey from European oak or American oak. So even if they had the choice to get a lot of ex Solera casks, they probably even wouldn't choose it by choice. So if the whiskey industry isn't actually using the casks that's normally used to age sherry through the Solera system, what kind of casks are they actually using when they talk about that they've aged in a sherry cask? Well generally, distillers will have a deal with a Spanish cooperage who specifically prepares and seasons a sherry cask for the whiskey industry. Yeah, well we had this uh, partnership really between McAllen and, and Williams and Humbert to start seasoning our casks and I think at this moment in time our our average seasoning period is about 18 months. Yeah. And how long does this Oloroso spend in the cask? In particular the American Oak Tandu cask we uh, we give uh, two years of uh, sherry seasoning. So basically once it's finished seasoning one cask it will go on to season another cask to prep that for the whiskey industry as well and when it's done it most likely won't be drunk as sherry. It actually is quite likely it will be turned into vinegar. So side note, one of the biggest producers for seasoning sherry casks for the whiskey industry, Paez Labato, is also the biggest producer of sherry vinegar, Paez Moria. So both the production of sherry and the production of sherry casks actually have fewer common grounds than a lot of whiskey lovers might think. But what's interesting is that sherry's kind of become you know, it's not as popular as it once was and they don't have the same amount of kind of profit coming through they once did. However, it's not true for the seasoning industry. That's completely booming because of the whiskey industry. So now that we've talked about sherry and we've talked about sherry casks, I really want to talk about some sherried whiskey that you should definitely know. A lot of sherried whiskey is actually from the region of Speyside, but I want to give this as strict a principle as I would say peat smokers from Isla. So I think the best way forward is to talk about some distilleries that are really well known for sherried whiskey. So the first distillery is a distillery that comes up on a lot of sherried lists, you know, when people are talking about their favorite sherry bombs, and that is the, the distillery Abelor. Uh, the 12 year old I think is great for beginners. They also have this one here which I really like which is the 12 year old non-chill filtered. It's bottled at 48% so great for whiskey geeks. But the most famous one you'll probably hear a lot about when talking about sherried whiskey is this one here. It's the Abelor Abana. So this is a car strength. It's 61.5%. Well my batches. It comes in different batches. Only matured in Oloroso sherry butts as opposed to the 12 year old which is aged in both ex-bourbon casks and ex-sherry butts. 
So the next distillery is probably the distillery I go to the most when I'm trying to introduce people to the sherry style of scotch, and that is the Tamdu Distillery. It's pretty much all their whiskey is exclusively matured in ex-sherry casks. So this 12 year old's a great one, it's a good introduction. But I've also got the cast strength here, which is also a really good sherry bomb. So the next sherry distillery is the Glendronach. So they're very well known for having ex sherry whiskey. The next distillery you should look into if you're into sherry whiskey is the Glen Farkless distillery. They also have a cast strength kind of sherry bomb thing called the Glen Farkless 105. So the next distillery that predominantly uses sherry cast is the Bunahaven distillery. Now I just want to talk about some whiskies where their whole brand's not known for sherried whiskey, but they do have some famous sherried whiskies. The first one is Glen Allake. So recently it was taken over by Billy Walker, who also used to run the Glendronach Distillery. So some other distilleries known for sherried whiskey that I don't actually have bottles of are the Glen the McAllen, and the Dalmore. But these days it feels like most distilleries now are doing some sort of sherried expression. There's so many other whiskies I could talk about and from Kilhoman, from Glen Turret, from Ben Romick, but I'm keen to hear what your favorite sherried whiskey is. Leave a comment down below and also as well, while you're down there, give the video a like, but above all, make sure you share and enjoy beauty.